Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we've got a British shooter, a shooter from over here, who's doing rather well over there in America at the Triple Classic in Texas. We go back in time six months to the shooting season we join, a syndicate day on the beautifully run Stolangtoft shoot in Suffolk. All this shooting, hard on the ears. We are reviewing ear defenders. I said we are reviewing ear defenders. First, the legendary Crowman Andy Crow is defending his peas from pigeons. When the Crowman calls, we come running. He thinks we're in for a good day on a farm where the pigeons are hitting the peas hard. The crop is doing okay given the dry spring, but pigeons enjoy all parts of this plant. Andy and his cousin Gary are helping out farm manager Martin. Before we head off to different corners, they have a pigeon powwow. Come on, we go over there. You two are going over there. We've been here for half an hour. <laughs> While they try and make a decision about where to go, we think it's going to end up in a fist fight. Sporting shooter editor Dom Holtum is also here today and has brought along something special. This is, uh, this is Alan's latest range of uh, glamouflage, I suppose, rather than camouflage. And um, we know that Andy Crow's a bit of a style guru, so uh, we thought we'd bring this along for him to try out. Um, I, think, I think it'll go down pretty well. So what does the crow man think? Here we get me a 20 ball next. 28. Look at that. Well, I'll strap with it. Then I'm going to put it over my shoulder. Well, you can't put it over your forearm, like a handbag. handbag. <laughs> I'm touched. Actually, that's a far calmer reaction than anticipated. There are plenty of pigeons on the move, so what sort of day does Andy reckon we're going to have? 23, 350. With the weather putting some pressure on crops this year, the least farmers can do is protect what they have. The pigeons are doing a lot of, uh, are starting to do a bit of damage, not major damage, because the peas are still growing a bit. There's still, they've had a little bit of rain here, which is quite handy, but, but yeah, we've got to try and protect what there is there, really, because uh, it's going to be a bad year. For, for the farmers, um, like you say, because of the drought, but we just have to see how it goes. After even more discussion, Dom and I head off with Andy to a quiet spot where the peas have been chomped by rabbits. The ideal spot is a no-go because of the cables. The ideal place would be along, along by the wood, but you've got a pylon straight in front of you, about 45, 50 yards out in the field. So I've done the next best thing, I've come back along. I've got a gap on the right hand side. The pigeons tend to follow the wood that's behind us. We've got another maize field behind us and we've got a wood further on. The pigeons tend to follow that and come back through here and go out to the other pea fields where the other two chaps are, Gary and uh, Justin. Um, hopefully I'm gonna get a few shots as they're making out to them. Um, and like you say, the reason is it's, it's short right away along this headland in this corner. I'm gonna set a whirly out and a, and a flapper, just have a pattern out in front. Time to gather some materials for the hide. So what I'm doing, I like to, as you know, I like to have the hide um, out away from the hedge. If I can, always use hazel because uh, oh, it's, it's just like a fan, as you can see. You better off cut it too long, take it back to the hide and cut it to the size that you want. Um, but yeah, I use hazel. Um, I've got a couple of nice bits on here. Just have a walk through and find some better bits. Um, just to make it, because it, it goes up and you can lay it against the hide and it makes like a fan. It comes over the top and around. You have the front low, and if the pigeon can see in there and he can see you, if you have it built up all round, that's, that's what you need. It's very much a homemade affair, and it has to be pretty big to accommodate us all. Uh, this is about their... Time for the decoys. I think this must be about their eighth, eighth trip out. This time of year they don't last very long. Um, but they get chucked straight in the freezer. They are marked. Um, I'll chuck them straight in the freezer when I get back. And all the ones that are on the cradles, I know which ones are which, so I'll keep them separate from everything else. But I always use dead birds. Uh, they're a lot better than plastics. Till I find something, a plastic or a decent decoy that I take the place of a real bird, I'll, I'll use real birds. And that's how I've always been. That's how my granddad was and my uncle always were. They'd always use real ones, they never used to use plastic. So. The flapper may be good at attracting pigeons, but it spooks dogs. Nancy is owned and trained by one of Andy's friends. She is quite a hound and will prove her worth later when she needs to find the birds dropping in the deep crop. When she's not on the lookout for pigeons, of course, there are other smells to pick up. This fox makes a break for it. Nancy just makes sure he's not in the firing line. 
Talking of firing line, we've stuck a camera onto Andy's barrel today to give us his point of view. So not only has he got to think about his lead, he has to think about our leads and wires too. Andy proves a good shot with gun and camera. The difficult thing is asking him to keep the gun on the bird after it's hit. His natural instinct is to fix on the next inbound pigeon. With a few birds down, Andy tidies up the pattern and shows us why peas provide a three-course meal for the woodies. They've got the leaves to feed on, they've got the flowers, and then you get down here, you've got the pods. They can eat the pods whole when they're that sort of size, but then they, they do grab hold of them and they, they do break them. Um, so there's your, there's your feed. When he takes a look at the crop, he finds soft fruit too. That last pigeon I shot, I just picked up, it's, uh, well, that's one of the cherries, but it's got a load of cherries in it. So, so if it's not the peat pea farmers, it's going to be the... The cherry farmers. Yeah, they'll be on the, they love soft fruit, love cherries. The birds are being a bit tricky today, coming in from behind. Andy there, thinks they are spotting the whirly through the gap in the oh, tree line. Pigeons, there's a, a gap in the hedge just along to our right hand side. And what the pigeons are doing, they're coming up, um, going towards the corner of the wood. And they're see, seeing the, the whirly through the gap in the hedge and they're just diving through in the wind. And that's why they're coming in a bit better now. It's getting to that time of day. It's now about half past one, uh, or quarter past half past one. And uh, they know they've got to come out and feed. And that's why they're starting to come into the decoys a bit better now. And uh, well, hopefully we'll pick up a good bag. Dom heads off to change out of his jack pike and into his whites for an afternoon's cricket. We can stay on for another hour and the birds are definitely getting hungrier. We leave Andy a bit shy of his total, then we get the call the next day. Andy tells us Gary and Martin ended up having quite a day, but he shot 191 birds, mainly between 3 and 5 o'clock. He witnesses something he'd only seen a handful of times in all his years pigeon shooting. Birds hovering, almost trying to land on the whirly. At one point he says he couldn't reload fast enough and there were five pigeons just in front of the hide. These birds never cease to amaze and provide great sport. Now, uh, amnesia. What's that the first sign of? Madness, that's right. And uh, blindness, what do you get that from? Can't remember. Deafness definitely comes from shooting. We talk to sporting shooter editor Dominic Holtam about ear defenders. The average speaking voice is around 60 decibels. A lawnmower is 100 decibels, and the average human pain threshold for sound is 110 decibels. What a lot of people don't realise is that every increase of 10 decibels effectively doubles the size of the sound. Hearing damage can begin at around 85 decibels if you're exposed to sound for a long time. An unmoderated rifle is around 160 decibels. So it's pretty clear that hearing protection for shooters is essential. So there are lots and lots of types of hearing protection on the market from a few pence to many, many pounds. We've got three uh, right across the price spectrum here from these, which are your average soft type, really easy to use, squish them up, stick them in your ear. Ideal for occasional shooters or if you've got friends that are coming along shooting. The problem is once they're in your ear, they are blocking the sound from getting in. So if you then want to have a conversation, they're not great. Also, not great for reusing, but as a kind of backup, absolutely ideal. Probably the most popular type is the earmuff type of defender. These come in uh, in different forms, either passive or active, and these are the latter. They're about between 85 and 100 pounds. These are from Jack Pike's Pro Sport range. Um, stick them over your ears, but unlike a normal set of ear defenders, if you turn these on, 
they actually amplify sounds up to about nine times. So you can hear a quiet conversation, you can hear the birds singing. They're pretty comfortable to wear. I wore them pigeon shooting the other day for a few hours. They were absolutely ideal. Um, as soon as they register a loud sound, it cuts the decibel level. Uh, but then if you have a break in the action, you can have a chat, absolutely ideal. Right at the top of the range, we've got this product. This is new, this is from Siemens. It's called the Secure Ear Device. These are actually custom made to the shooter. You get an impression made by the audiologist, he'll take a cast of your ear. Then Siemens, who specialise in hearing aids for the NHS people like that, fits almost completely in your ear canal. It's got a volume control. It reduces loud noises by up to 35 decibels, which is a huge, huge difference. Um, probably comparable to putting a suppressor on your rifle. Not cheap, around the 500 pound mark, but comfortable to wear all day. The batteries last for about 230 hours. Really, really clever technology if you've got the cash. So having used all three types, um, the level of sound suppression is actually quite similar, even with the cheapy foam ones. The difference is obviously once they're in, you lose all your peripheral hearing, uh, you can't hear anything until you take them out really. Um, with the others, they give good amplification, the, uh, the middle of the road ones, the ear defender type, pretty good, you can hear what's going on. The big difference when you then move up to these kiddies from Siemens is the clarity of the sound. It really is crystal clear. You can hear all the sounds of nature going around. So you know, if you're out, you can hear every snap of a twig. Very, very crisp, very, very clear, very, very comfortable to wear. Um, and crucially, when you pull the trigger, it makes a big difference to the noise that's hitting your ears. You know you're not going to be causing yourself harm uh, and you're going to look after your hearing for the future. And you can read more about Ear Defenders in Sporting Shooter magazine. Now to Texas, to the Triple Classic, where once again the British are doing pretty well. If there were ever a part of America that epitomises that country's close relationship with firearms, it's Texas, where gun ownership far exceeds the national average of 96 guns per 100 people. The cream of the globe sporting shot congregates first at San Antonio for the World English Sporting Clays Championship and then Houston for the Triple Classic. When it comes to the last shots of the World English Super Final, it is appropriately an English shooter, George Digweed, who has to break six out of his last eight if he wants to walk away with the trophy. Like any Englishman in a tight spot, George digs deep and takes a seven to collect his 19th world title and go into the sports history books for winning two world sporting titles in a single year. I've tried to uh, pace myself throughout it, um, but, in, but in pacing myself I've sort of taken things a little bit easier, not put quite so much effort into one round and then been tired for another round and I think it's probably benefited my shooting. You know, I haven't been tight for any event and I've just gone out and tried to break as many targets as possible. Following on from that success, can George stay on form? The best of the best head to Houston to go head to head at one of the biggest events of the year, the Triple Classic. The Rio Brazos Hunting Preserve is one of the finest venues in America, featuring lakes, woodland and grassland, more like a Ryder Cup golf course than the playgrounds we're used to in the UK. Shooting stateside is simply bigger and better. Here's the word from sponsor Blaza. First of all, I'm excited that the Triple Classic is back in the US and even more excited back here in Texas, uh, where our headquarters is in San Antonio, which is only two hours away from here, uh, which is almost makes it a home game for us. Uh, therefore, we took the opportunity and uh, be a main sponsor of this event, uh, we sponsored a fee test course. I've been with other gun companies and seeing the performance of the F3 shotguns, it's, it's fantastic. The final day sees the competitors make one last push towards the finishing post. It is the end of a three-day, 300 target marathon. Before the shooter started, we laid and checked all the targets on the white course, that's 30 traps. We checked through the blue course, another 30 traps, and we checked through all of the FITAS course. So we did all of that roughly by the time the shooters started coming out at 8 o'clock this morning. We're here during the day looking after the traps. Uh, 
occasional issues come up, people forget how to use buttons, there might be something happen that we support, and the guys are out on four wheelers or quad bikes, and we'll respond to those using our radios, get in, we've got two minutes to fix any issues, or we'll swap the trap out. Towards the end of the day, we'll be supporting the super final, which is on the ground over to my left here. Uh, some fantastic shooting at last night's five stand super final, and the fit ass tonight will be no less. Then, once the shooters have gone home, we'll be out on the ground till about 10 o'clock tonight, checking anything that's been an issue to us and getting ready for tomorrow's shooting. As the competition for these six final places gets hotter than the desert sun, Richard folds, folds up. George is the last Brit standing for the upcoming shootout. Down in the arena for the final, it's clear from the start that George has only one thing on his mind, winning, as he straights the first stand. He widens his lead to six points and takes it with a stellar 312. As well as collecting the main event trophy, he also adds the high all-around win to his haul, which nets him a $15,000 gun making his two weeks stateside a lucrative trip. Yee-haw, as we British now say. A full-length version of that item is available to watch on our new programme stream, www.claysports.tv. Next up, we're going real bird shooting, back to last season, the Stolang Toft shoot in Suffolk, and it's a syndicate day. Guns have been gathering at the Stolang Toft estate in Suffolk as guests of the Catchpole family for 80 years. The recently refurbished shooting lodge has a welcoming fire and history on the walls. John Catchpole is the shoot captain and has been running the days here for nearly half a century. He and his family are always there to add that personal touch, ready to meet greet and make sure everyone has a good time. Today it's a syndicate day and they know they're in for some high velocity partridges, some tricky pheasants and maybe a woodcock or two. There are plenty of drives here that separate the men from the boys. It's all high class sport. We head off to the first drive. The estate has 22 on offer. The plan has already been drawn up between John and the head keeper Robert Frost. The speed, direction and mix of the birds give a great first show and everyone is getting some shots in. Shooter Rob has had 40 days of sport so far this season. He knows what he wants from a day. He found the Stolang Toft estate through gunsonpegs.com. It's a home, homely type shoot, it's a family run affair, you know, there's a good few birds around. Generally the hospitality of the day and the general organisation is excellent, you know, you, you're not rushed through, beaters are excellent. You know, John and uh, Roger who run the shoot, you know, very friendly, very informative and uh, yeah, a good bunch of guns, you know, so it's a nice friendly place to come shooting. What makes or breaks a shoot for you? Okay, well I think shoots are generally fall into two categories. You want, you know, your pure commercial shoot where you pay your money and you expect to kill hundreds of birds or you're looking for something that's generally a good day and going out with a bunch of friends and that fits this category. You know, there's a decent number of birds down, you get your numbers in a non-pressurised way, you know, so you're not expected to kill everything that flies over your head. You can be selective, you can take the nice high birds and at the end of the day everybody walks away smiling, which is what it should be about, you know, game shooting is about a sport rather than of pure competition. I can go and break clays every day of the week, you know, and I've done 40 odd days this year, so, yeah, I've seen a few and you get the bad and the smooth, and this is definitely one of the better ones. Time for a coffee and biscuits with a special backdrop. It's a chance to find out a little bit more about the charm of the place. Well, we're, we're trying to make enjoyable shooting, preserve wildlife, and not shoot vast numbers of birds, shoot what we can use ourselves and the guns can take away and you know, that the birds that can be processed locally to give people good sport, preserve the, the woodland and the countryside and uh, wildlife in general, you know, because just feeding pheasants actually feeds a huge number of wild, other wild birds as well and the, the maize and uh, sorghum covers we use for the shoot is very beneficial to many other wild birds. What about the, the, the guns themselves? What sort of reaction do you get from them? Do you get, I mean, it looks as if you get people coming 
back time and time again? We do, yes, and they come from all professions, you know, uh, farmers, solicitors, uh, um, business people in general, people from all walks of life, really. We seem to get very favourable comments. <laughs> After a sugar boost, the team head off for some Polaris-like partridges. This drive is a particular favourite of James Horn from Guns on Pegs. Yeah, it's a fantastic shoot this is. Uh, the catch poles lay on a really super day and uh, I think their hospitality is sort of second to none really and they've got a lovely shoot lodge here. Um, it's a small shoot. A lot of Guns on Pegs members come here and uh, have enjoyed themselves. In fact there's one here today who now comes nine times a year. So clearly uh, they're doing something right here and uh, on the drive behind me here, fabulous birds. We've just seen 40 to 50 yard birds up and um, some of them are rather better than the guns on this day and uh, with a bit of wind East Anglian uh, partridge shooting can be as good as anywhere. They come out some speed don't they? Yeah they do they've certainly been beaten today and uh, great fun to watch and uh, of course you know when you're on form and you can get them it's very very satisfying and one of the things about you know this type of shooting compared to West Country shooting is that on its day, this can be just as testing as the high birds. And, you know, it's, if you're travelling around the country, this is a great place to come. And you're a lucky man because you can travel the country and you, you can see these, the, the variety of, of shooting we have in this country. Indeed, and that's one of the fun things. Because, I mean, you know, people who shoot high birds all the time, they'll get in a muddle on some of these. So, uh, and equally, you know, the people who are shooting, you know, partridge shooting and then they're going to do the Devon shooting. We're just talking to a guy, again, another Guns on Pegs uh, member. Uh, he went down to Devon for the first time this week and had a whale of a time. But he said, golly, it was a totally different form of shooting. But that doesn't mean it's any harder or any more difficult, it's just different. And that's the beauty of what we've got in the UK, of just an enormous variety of shooting. We move around 90 degrees and beaters push through a wood. The birds just keep coming. The slower pheasants are almost a welcome break from the blur of partridge. Both guns and dogs are kept busy. Homemade sausage rolls and a little warming gives the guns a chance to catch their breath and compare notes. Peter enjoys what this estate has to offer. Uh, for me, predominantly, it's about the sport. So it's about how the birds fly, how they're presented, how everybody works in this part of the day. And that includes the guns. The guns are a working part of the day. Uh, the social aspect is secondary, but very nice if it is as it is here. Very good. Finally, the rain that's been threatening all day arrives. Pheasants and woodcock break cover on this next drive. The bag is building nicely. The last drive is a stone's throw from the shooting lodge and you can almost smell supper. As the guns wait, the rain comes down again. Then the floodgates really open with birds galore coming from all angles, heights and speeds. Some come straight to us, others curl over the farm buildings giving guns some challenging late shots. It's been a busy day for everyone with a respectable bag of 170 birds. The guns are happy, the biggest critic is usually the gamekeeper himself. Now I'm not displeased with the day. I was looking for 150 and finished 170. So I hope everyone's happy. This is only my second year here, but I've been on the neighbouring estates for the last 18 years and we do a lot of party shooting at home. And I brought most of my beaters from there to here when I took over. Um, so they take a lot of weight off my shoulders because they can see if anything's going wrong, they'll run and put it right for me. And I'm only as good as my beaters. The food is hearty and just what the doctor ordered. 
as the sun finally makes an appearance, we leave this syndicate day at the Stolangtoft estate well fed and very well looked after. Well, you can watch that film and others like it on gunsonpegs.com. We made all the films there, actually. Now, a couple of points of housekeeping, as they say in Syndicate Day. First of all, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. I look at the viewfinder. Yeah, it's about there on YouTube, OK? If you can't bear the thought of YouTube, go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. Scroll down to the bottom where you can like us on Facebook. We can tweet about ourselves to you on Twitter and you can pop your email address into the constant contact form and we'll email you every week. We're out from 7pm on Wednesdays and there are 70,000 of you watching every month which is fantastic. We're twice as big as any of the shooting magazines. This has been Field Sports Britain. We're back next week and don't you love us? Don't you want to watch us over and over again? Well now you can with our DVDs. <laughs>